The New Heaven Have you ever pictured heaven? Maybe your mind wanders to scenes from movies like What Dreams May Come or The Lovely Bones. Or perhaps the image of meeting Morgan Freeman in a pristine white room comes to mind. But what does the Bible really say about heaven? It's a topic that's far from simple. And as New Testament scholar Paula Goodert notes, biblical beliefs about heaven have brought a lot of controversy about the topic. By the end of this video, you will have a clearer picture of what heaven is actually all about. Number one, heaven is not just an after-death destination. A lot of people mix up heaven and paradise, usually asking themselves, what happens to me after I die? This thought brings comfort to those who have lost someone and gives hope to people who are in pain or close to dying. But really, in the beginning, heaven and paradise were thought of more as places where God lives, not where we go after we die. Heaven in biblical language, in Hebrew, Shemayim, and Greek, Oranos. The words for heaven can also mean sky. It's not an eternal, unchanging realm, but a part of creation itself. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 describes heaven as part of the world's creation, primarily as God's dwelling place, a parallel realm where everything aligns with God's will. It's a place of peace, love, community, and worship, bustling with a heavenly court and other celestial beings. Heaven's imagery in the Bible. The paradise, a metaphor for Persian culture. Paradise in Persian royal gardens is called Paradida, where really beautiful places with lots of different plants and walls around them, kind of like a perfect garden on earth. The Garden of Eden, which is described in Genesis 2 of the Bible, sounds a lot like these Persian gardens. It was full of water and fruit and was really nice to look at and it's where God would spend time talking with Adam and Eve. Where is heaven, really? Wondering where heaven actually is? Well, you're not alone. The Bible talks a lot about heaven being real, but it doesn't hand us a map with a you are here mark on heaven. So what's the deal? Simply put, heaven is where God is. It's like asking where the wind is. You can't exactly pinpoint it, but you know it's there. Heaven is more than just a place. The Bible refers to a place called the third heaven and paradise. It is necessary to boast, though nothing is gained by it, but I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, only God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know that such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, only God knows. Four was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which man is not permitted to speak, words too sacred to tell. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1-4 through 4. In this verse, Paul talks about a man who got a VIP tour of heaven but couldn't really put it into words. Imagine trying to explain the color blue to someone who's never seen colors. It's kind of like that. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 17, it talks about believers being caught up to be with the Lord. It's like God's big elevator to heaven. So, is heaven way up above the clouds? There are hints. In Genesis chapter 11, verse 7, God talks about going down to see the Tower of Babel. Psalm 103, verse 11, mentions heaven being high above the earth. And in Psalm chapter 14, verse 2, it's where God looks down from. Even Jesus is described in John chapter 3, verse 13, as having come down from and gone up to heaven. God, not limited by our space and time. Before the existence of the universe, God existed. He created the skies, firmament, the celestial bodies, the stars, and the earth. This explains the fact that he had existed before time and space and had been staying in a place beyond time and space which he created. He said, let there be light, which describes the expansion of the universe and the creation of bodies that lighted the world. But here's a twist. Since God is spirit, heaven isn't just a far-off place like a vacation spot for heavenly beings. Greek gods were thought to hang out in their own celestial paradise, but the God of the Bible isn't on a permanent vacation. He's always around. James chapter 4 verse 8 tells us that God is close when we reach out to Him, and Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 and 22 encourage us to draw near to Him. 
This sums up the fact that God indeed lives outside our space. He is not contained by the universe because He had created it. God's throne is placed in heaven, a place of eternity that is not within our universe. Psalm 113, verses 4 through 6 says, The Lord is exalted over all the nations. His glory above the heavens, who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stooped down to look on the heavens and the earth. He stoops down to look, meaning he is above while the earth, skies and firmament is below. Imagine a situation when something is placed beneath where you are. You can view such an object from all its angles. You are different from the object and not a part of it. In the same way, God is in heaven, which is above the sky and beyond our universe. Sure, heaven is where saints and angels are gathered, and they need a place because they exist just like we do. But when we say God is in heaven, it's more like saying He's on a different level of existence, not just chilling in a different place. Heaven. Close to us in more ways than one. The Bible, especially the New Testament, talks about heaven a lot. But it's not so big on giving GPS coordinates. Maybe that's on purpose. Perhaps it's more important to focus on God Himself rather than getting caught up in where His home base is. It's like focusing more on who's at a party rather than the location of the party. While hell is described as a place of separation and punishment, like in Matthew chapter 8, verses 12, and Matthew chapter 22, verse 13, heaven is all about fellowship, joy, and worshiping God. So, where is heaven? It's less about a physical place and more about being with God. Heaven is where God is, and since He's always near us, heaven isn't as far away as we might think. It's not about the where, but the who and the why. Heaven is about being in God's presence, enjoying eternal joy, and most importantly, being part of the ultimate worship session. Humanity's separation and reconciliation with God. The narrative of human disobedience leading to expulsion from Eden is a story of separation from God's presence. Despite the separation from God's presence, we see Jesus as the bridge back to God in paradise. The Easter story, celebrated globally, marks Jesus' resurrection as the first hint of what's possible for humanity. Resurrection and eternal life with God. As Revelation, the last book of the Bible, depicts heaven and paradise ultimately merge, envisioning a new, renewed heaven descending to earth, not as an escape but as a fulfillment and healing of creation. What will reconciliation with God look like? At the end of Jesus' thousand-year reign, heaven as we know it will change. God will bring in the new Jerusalem, our forever home. Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 4. Our current bodies can't handle eternity, but our new ones will be perfect forever. At the end, Revelation shows a picture like the Garden of Eden, but this time it's like a big diverse city where people come together, united with God and with each other. It's like imagining a perfect world, meant to make us believe not only in God, but also in the idea of a world filled with love and getting along with each other. Therefore, heaven or paradise in the Bible is more than a mere afterlife location. It's a symbol of God's dwelling. This makes us think about more than just where we go after we die. It makes us consider how we can live out heaven's good values in our lives today. According to the Bible, heaven isn't really about a certain place you can find on a map. It's more about being in tune with what God wants and understanding that there's a lot more to life than what we can see with our eyes. But there is so much more that you need to know about heaven, and so make sure you keep watching till the end to have a better understanding of this topic. Number two, there is no death or sickness in heaven. Have you ever wondered what heaven is like? Imagine a place where there's no sickness or death. Sounds pretty amazing, right? That's what the Bible tells us about heaven, but sometimes it can be a bit confusing to understand. No longer shall there be in it an infant who lives only a few days, or an old man who does not finish his days. For the youth who dies at the age of a hundred and the one who does not reach the age of a hundred will be thought of as accursed. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20. This verse seems a bit puzzling at first, right? It talks about death, which seems strange when we think about heaven. Isaiah was using the language and ideas of his time to give us a glimpse of what heaven, a perfect place, would be like. Now, 
Let's look at Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, which says, And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be death. There will no longer be sorrow and anguish or crying or pain, for the former order of things has passed away. This verse tells us that in heaven, all forms of suffering and pain, like death and crying, will be gone forever. Imagine that, a place where you never have to say goodbye, and nobody ever gets sick. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13, we find another clue. It says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. According to this verse, the new heaven and new earth will be totally different from what we know here. It's like moving from a really old house that has lots of problems to a brand new, perfect one that's just been built. So, when we read Isaiah chapter 65, verse 20, which talks about death, we have to remember that Isaiah was using a picture to describe something indescribable. He was trying to tell us that heaven is a place where life is so good and full, much better than the best life we can imagine here on earth. Do believers go to heaven right after death? People have all sorts of ideas about heaven, but let's see what the Bible has to say. The Bible says if you believe in Jesus, you go straight to heaven when you die. Let's talk about some different views. And there's the Roman Catholic Church, which teaches about purgatory. They say that believers go to this place to make up for sins that Jesus' death didn't cover. Once they've gone their time there, they can head on to paradise. But here's the thing. These ideas aren't really found in the Bible. Jesus and the two criminals. Now, let's dive into what the Bible says. Remember the story of Jesus on the cross with two criminals. One of them asked Jesus to remember him when he came into his kingdom. Jesus' response is super important. He said in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Notice Jesus didn't say, Hang tight, you'll be with me after a bit of suffering, or you'll be in a deep sleep for a while. He said, Today, meaning right after death, that criminal would be with Jesus in paradise. Paul on heaven after death. The Apostle Paul also gives us some clues. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Paul isn't talking about being unconscious or in purgatory. He's saying that being away from our body means being with the Lord. That's immediate, not after some delay. Jesus and the rich man and Lazarus. Remember this story. When Lazarus, the beggar, dies, he's taken straight to Abraham's side by angels. Luke chapter 16, verse 22. There's no waiting period. It happens right away. What about people who are martyred for their faith? In Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, John sees the souls of martyrs under the altar in heaven, talking with the Lord. Seems like as soon as they died for their faith, they were in heaven. So, when a believer dies, their spirit leaves their body and goes to be with Jesus. That's a pretty amazing thought. And when the rapture happens, our spirits will get to rejoin our resurrected bodies. These new bodies are going to be amazing. No sickness, no aging, no suffering, and definitely no death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 through 53. Paul sums it up perfectly when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 55 through 57, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's saying here is that death isn't the end for believers. Thanks to Jesus, we get to win over death and live forever with Him. In short, if you believe in Jesus when you die, you don't go into a deep sleep or to a place of punishment. You go directly to heaven to be with the Lord. And that's a comforting and joyful promise. Heaven is waiting for you the moment you leave this life. When people go to heaven, do they become angels? Short answer, no, they don't. Let me explain why this is a bit of a mix-up and what actually happens according to the Bible. First off, people and angels are completely different creations of God. They're as different as, say, dogs and horses. Just as dogs can't turn into horses, people don't transform into angels after they die. It's not like a video game where you level up and change species. Now, why do people sometimes think we become angels? 
Well, it's probably because angels are often described in the Bible as looking kind of like humans. But that doesn't mean we're the same. It's like mistaking a mannequin for a real person just because they look similar. So, were angels made in God's image just like us? The Bible doesn't specifically say that. What it does make clear is that humans are not angels. In Psalm chapter 8, verses 4 through 5, King David is talking to God and says, What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of earth-born man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. It's important to note that when Jesus came to earth, he became fully human, which put him for a time a little lower than the angels. This was part of his big sacrifice for us. Even angels helped Jesus out while he was on earth, like when they ministered to him in the wilderness. See Matthew 4 and Mark 1. It shows that Jesus really did step into our shoes. Angels have their own roles. They're messengers and worshipers of God, and sometimes they even act as warriors. Their job description includes being able to exist in both heaven and earth, something we humans can't do. But here's the cool part. When we die, we get a new body. But it's not an angelic one. This new body is made to last in the eternal life of heaven. The Apostle Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 52. Listen very carefully. I tell you a mystery, a secret truth decreed by God and previously hidden, but now revealed. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be completely changed, wondrously transformed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet call, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead who believed in Christ will be raised imperishable, and we will be completely changed, wondrously transformed. This means that our new bodies will be perfect for living in heaven forever, but they won't be angel bodies. They'll be, well, super upgraded human bodies. So, in simple terms, becoming an angel isn't in the cards for us. We stay humans, just a glorified version of ourselves, made to enjoy heaven forever. Angels will still be angels, doing their angelic things, and will be us, only better, forever young, healthy and happy in heaven. So, what does this all mean for us? It means that heaven is a place where all the bad things we experience here on earth, like sickness, sadness, and death, won't exist. It's a place of complete joy, peace, and righteousness. It's a place where we live in perfect harmony with God without any of the troubles we face in this life. In heaven, we'll see the full picture of what God has promised us, a life free from all the pain and suffering of this world. It's something we can all look forward to and find hope in, especially in our toughest times. So, when you think about heaven, remember, it's not just a place up in the sky. It's a whole new creation where everything is perfect and where we'll live the way God always intended for us, in complete happiness and without fear of death or illness. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful place to be? Number three, there are mansions in heaven. What did Jesus mean by mansions in heaven? You know, the part where he talks about going to prepare a place for us in his father's house and how there are many mansions or rooms there. John chapter 14, verses two through three. This has confused quite a number of people, especially when they picture heaven as this big neighborhood with fancy houses lined up on streets of gold. The confusion mainly comes from how some translations of the Bible use the word mansions, but let's break it down in a way that makes more sense. First off, the original Greek word that's often translated as house means more like a home or a dwelling place, not necessarily a physical building. And the word that gets translated as mansions or rooms is really about staying or residing somewhere. So, when Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions, He's not talking about a real estate development in the sky. What he's actually saying is this, in God's heavenly home, there's a place for lots of people in God's family to live together. It's not about each of us getting a mega mansion with our name on the mailbox. It's more about being part of a huge family, living together with God. This idea is very different from those images of individual luxury houses that some people have in mind. Jesus' main point was to reassure his disciples and us by extension that he's got a special place for us in heaven. He's preparing a space in God's presence where we can all be together. It's like he's setting up a big family reunion where everyone's invited and there's room for everybody. The apostle John gives us another glimpse of this in Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. After these things, I looked 
And this is what I saw. A vast multitude which no one could count, gathered from every nation and from all the tribes and peoples and languages of the earth, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, Christ, dressed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. According to this verse, great multitude in heaven that no one could number are all gathered together before the throne. Notice how John's vision is about a big crowd, all together, not people hanging out in separate luxury pads. So, what does this mean for us? This means that heaven is less about getting our own fancy place and more about being close to God and each other. It's about community, belonging, and being a part of a big, happy family with God Himself being the head. This idea of living together with God and others in heaven is really heartwarming if you think about it. It's not about how big or fancy our heavenly home will be. It's about being with Jesus, being with our loved ones, and being part of a vast family of believers from all times and places. The best part of it all is that we will recognize each other in heaven. Hey, have you ever wondered if when you get to heaven, you'll be able to recognize our friends and family? It's a pretty common question, and honestly, it's kind of comforting to think about reuniting with loved ones in heaven. So, let's dive into what the Bible has to say about this. To start with, the Bible doesn't directly say you'll definitely recognize your grandma in heaven, but there are hints and stories that suggest we will know each other. For instance, in the Bible, Jesus tells his disciples about going to prepare a place for them in his Father's house with many rooms. Jesus doesn't directly answer our question, but it does show that Jesus cares about us having a place in heaven. The confusion comes from trying to understand how things will work in heaven. It's like trying to explain the internet to someone from the 1800s. It's tough because they don't have anything to compare it to. Let's talk about some of the arguments and what the Bible says about them. First, marriage in heaven. Some people think that if we recognize our spouses in heaven, it might contradict what Jesus said about people not being married in heaven. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. But recognizing someone doesn't necessarily mean you'll still be married to them. It's more about knowing who they are. Second, personal identities after death. There are stories in the Bible where people are recognized after death. For example, King Saul recognized the prophet Samuel after his death. 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 3 through 25. And King David was confident he would see his infant son again in the afterlife. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 23. These stories suggest we keep our personal identities in heaven. Third, Jesus' resurrection. After Jesus rose from the dead, he was recognized by his friends. John chapter 20, verse 27. Plus, during the transfiguration, Elijah and Moses showed up and were recognized. Matthew chapter 17. This gives us a pretty good hint that we'll be recognizable too. Fourth, heavenly reunion. The Apostle Paul talks about being caught up together with others in heaven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. This sounds a lot like a reunion where people recognize each other. Remembering our lives. Some people worry that remembering our lives on earth might bring back bad memories in heaven. But the Bible says that God will wipe away every tear. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4. This doesn't necessarily mean we'll forget everything. It might just mean that our past sorrows won't hurt us anymore. Names in heaven. The Bible even talks about names being important in heaven. For example, in Revelation chapter 21 verses 12 through 14. The names of the apostles and the sons of Israel are written on the New Jerusalem. This suggests that personal identity is important and remembered. So, will we recognize each other in heaven? The Bible gives us enough clues to believe that we will know our loved ones in heaven. It's not about holding on to earthly relationships as they were, but about enjoying a new kind of relationship in a place where love and joy are perfect. In the end, it seems that heaven will be a place where we'll not only be with God, but also with each other in a way that's more amazing than we can imagine. It's like the best family reunion ever, where everyone is happy, everyone gets along, and nobody ever has to say goodbye. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing to look forward to? So, next time you hear about those mansions in heaven, remember it's not about moving into a celestial Beverly Hills, 
It's about moving into a loving, joyous, and eternal community where everyone is welcome and where Jesus himself is the reason we're all there. Now, isn't that an amazing thing to look forward to? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, our hearts and minds turn towards the mysteries and wonders of heaven, a place so many of us think of but know so little about. We come before you in humility, seeking wisdom and understanding about this divine realm. Lord, we acknowledge that our understanding of heaven is limited and shaped by earthly perspectives and human imagination. We often picture heaven based on scenes from movies or stories we've heard, yet we know these are mere glimpses of its true glory. Father, guide us in our understanding and help us to see heaven through the lens of your word and your truth. We thank you, God, for the assurance of heaven that you have given us through your scriptures. We are comforted by the thought of a place beyond our earthly realm, a place where you dwell in full majesty and splendor. Yet, Lord, we recognize that heaven is not just a distant location, but a reality intertwined with our daily lives. Father, we are often caught up in our earthly journeys, focusing on our immediate needs and challenges. Help us to lift our eyes towards heaven, not as an escape from our world, but as a source of hope and inspiration. Teach us to live with an eternal perspective, understanding that our time on earth is just a brief moment in the grand narrative of your kingdom. God, we are amazed by the concept that heaven is where you are, and you are not confined by space or time. You are as close to us as our very breath, yet you also dwell in the heavenly realms. This mystery is beyond our full understanding, but we take comfort in knowing that you are always near, always watching over us, and always guiding our steps. As we ponder the realities of heaven, we are reminded of the promise of eternal life with you. This promise brings light to our darkest days and hope to our most desperate moments. Help us to hold on to this promise, especially in times of sorrow and loss, and let it be a source of constant reassurance and peace. Lord, we pray for those among us who are struggling with doubts or fears about the afterlife. May your Holy Spirit provide comfort and clarity, revealing the truth about heaven in ways that resonate with each heart. Let us be a source of encouragement to one another, sharing our faith and hope in the life to come. We are grateful, Father, for the glimpses of heaven you have provided in your word. Scriptures like Revelation paint a picture of a renewed world where there is no more pain, no more tears, and where we live in perfect harmony with you. This vision inspires us to work towards a world filled with love, peace, and justice, reflecting the values of your kingdom. We also pray, God, for the wisdom to understand the difference between heavenly promises and earthly expectations. Help us to discern the spiritual truths from the cultural portrayals, focusing on your teachings rather than human interpretations. Guide our churches, our leaders, and our communities in spreading the accurate message of what heaven is and what it represents. Finally, Lord, we ask for a heart that longs for heaven, not just as a future destination, but as a present reality in our lives. May the hope of heaven shape how we live, how we love, and how we serve. Let the promise of eternity with you motivate us to spread your love and grace to those around us. We thank you, Father, for the mystery, the beauty, and the promise of heaven. We look forward to the day when we will see it in its full glory. But until then, help us to live in the light of its truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. However, many people ask what angels are doing in heaven right now. To find out what angels do in heaven, click here.